down. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> well, as I said, here he is, the man to whom the man wouldn't be the man without the man. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Um, would you like to start off with something? We just throw open it up. Well, let's see here. First of all, welcome. Welcome to Pensacon and uh, really having a good time. One of the things that I always enjoy, and this will kind of lead into a few other things, is the fact that the Munsters is celebrating. It's almost 53 years old now. And what I really get a kick out of when I come out to meet the fans is the people my age, I'm 63, who watch it as a child. Obviously, I was working as a child. They watched it growing up with me. But the kids and the grandkids who are now watching it and enjoying it, it always makes me smile that the kids today will like something that was done so long ago because it's got good, fun, wholesome family values, which is really hard to find these days. So you get three generations of people watching the same show, and they come to these conventions like this, and it always warms my heart. What about the, what about the, uh, the, the, the never shown secret hidden show on the Munsters of the, of the slaughter? No, no, I'm kidding. Just yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the blooper reel. The blooper reel. <laughs> Actually, you know, Butch, I've known, I've known Butch from around conventions for a number of years now, but I've never asked this question. Maybe it'll lead into some, some questions from the audience. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. How did you get the role of Eddie Munster? You know, it's funny. People ask, how did you get in the show business? And back then, you really had to live in Los Angeles, or at least in the Hollywood area, which I did. And um, I was seven years old in second grade, and my little sister was a real little cute girl. And this gentleman in the city of Gardena wanted to be mayor. And... My father was kind of an influential guy, so they thought that my father was actually had adopted me, but my sister was his daughter. So they thought that if they could get Michelle into the movies, this would really put a feather in this guy's cap and he would become mayor of our little town. That was the premise. I went along for the ride during the photo shoot, and after they were done with her, the guy looked over at me, and his name was Amos Carr, and he was a famous Hollywood uh, photographer for kids. So he took a few photos of me. And he put a picture in his window on Hollywood Boulevard and a producer and a director, not quite Lana Turner at Schwab's drugstore, but they saw the picture in the window. They were casting a movie, no experience necess necessary, which I certainly qualified for. And my first interview I got, I got a little movie with Eddie Albert and Jane Wyatt and Soupy Sales and Brenda Lee. And I worked six weeks and then I got a commercial and then I got General Hospital and I just came naturally to me. So I started working by accident just going along for the ride. And then I did a year of The Real McCoys, and by the time The Munsters came around, I had actually been working for about four years. So how, were you, how old were you when you uh, did, did Eddie? 11 and 12. 11 and 12? Fifth, yeah, from fifth grade to seventh grade. <laughs> I love it, fifth grade to seventh grade. <laughs> yeah, I, I like working because it kept me out of public school. You know, I never had to go back to school. It's like, hey, this is not so bad, hanging around the studios and only three hours a day of school. But um, but it was it was a lot of fun. The, the Munsters itself, um, the success of it is phenomenal because we never, no one anticipated syndication in the 60s. And they, they made new shows every year, old shows fell by the wayside. But the fact that this little two-year series with this really, you know, insanely talented cast, and I'm not really speaking to myself, but Yvonne DiCarlo, Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis from Car 54, they were a wonderful comedy team. And then we had like the best makeup people, the best special effects people, and the best set designers because the, the, real, the real true I think longevity of the show has to do with the quality of the music and the guest stars and the writing. That's what keeps the show alive. And it was it was a it was an interesting mix of, of of doing the horror and the and the comedy yep. in the way it did. Um, uh, there was a whole bunch of shows like that uh, that were kind of oddball. I mean, I was thinking about Hogan's Heroes, uh, uh, you know, comedy in a camp, you know, yeah. a prison prison camp. They did a lot of strange things back. Well, a friend of mine who is a big Munsters fan and now a producer in Hollywood explained something to me that I never really noticed. He says, you know, in the 50s, they call that the golden age of television, but it really wasn't because in the 50s, what they were doing, they were really doing radio shows that just were visual, the way they were structured, where in the 60s, the sitcom gained its own niche and its own feel, and that's when the shows that I did, like I did a My Hero Martian, I did Mr. Ed's, uh, I Dream of Genies, a lot of the shows in the early 60s to the mid-60s really hit their stride with good comedy writing. You didn't have to really write about reality, so you had talking horses and Martians and genies and witches, <laughs> which led to the com com comedy writers had a field day writing anything they wanted because it would fly, literally, and then good 
um, talent. Like we had guest stars like Don Rickles and Frank Gorshin and Louis Nye and just every comedian in Hollywood was uh, available to do good comedy skits. So it was a really good time to be around um, writing and comedy. Excellent. Now, do we have any questions from the audience? Let's, which I yes, please. <laughs> no, she was. She never really did. She, as a teenager, she did a little work, but she didn't really want to. She was not a, a an outgoing little girl. I was kind of. They used to call me a thirty nine year old midget because I acted. <laughs> I acted like an adult when I was about eleven years old. And Michelle was kind of like a, a typical little girl that didn't really want to do this. So, you know, her interview turned into my career. She's okay with that. Yeah. We have a question back over here. Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe it was always just Kitty. It is. It is just roared. Yeah. Later, got a role with MTM as the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Up here, front. Right, 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 right. Excuse me. My most challenging role, believe it or not, was a movie, a little a movie of the week. When, after I did the Munsters, I went over to Disney, which is where, if you're a kid, that's really where you want to be. The Disney studio was the best place to, to wind up. And this, one summer, I did a couple of World of Colors, and they were both two-parters, and it kept me busy from June to September. But I did, I did a nice little role called The Young Loner, and it was about a, uh, the depression era, a Depression-era kid who was on the road with Edward Andrews, who was a huckster, con man. Kim Hunter, Academy Award winner, was this woman, and she owned this sheep farm. And I played a kid that ran away, and I landed in this sheep farm, and you know, one thing led to another. But I worked like six weeks straight, and I did a really good job on it, and it, 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 it required a lot of work. But another job that I really was proud of, well, a couple of them, actually, was The Phantom Tollbooth is a movie that Chuck Jones did. It was his only feature movie. And doing this feature, it was live action and fantasy and, and animated, but it took like two years to do because they would do it in segments. Every three or four months, they'd write another maybe 10 or 15 minutes of the movie, and then they would catch up. So for a few years, I was working with the, you know, Noel, uh, I mean, um, Mel Blanc, uh, Dawes Butler, all the, all the voice, June Foray, uh, Hans Conrad, all the greatest people in animation were working for Chuck at that time, and I happened to be the only kid in the movie. So that was a really great time, and it was very challenging. Thank you. So I'll the hand over here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it wasn't as tough as you might have thought because what they did is Monday and Tuesday were very light days, non-makeup days. We would read a new script on Monday. We would meet in the producer's office around 10 o'clock. They would read it. It would take maybe until 11, 11.30, and then they, everybody would go home, and I'd go do my three hours of school. Uh, Tuesdays was a rehearsal day, and they would block for camera angles and lighting, and it, usually we had a new director every week. There was like six or seven directors that rotated through. So they would work until maybe 2 in the afternoon, from 10 to 2, and no makeup again, and then I would go to school for another three hours. Um, but Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday were film days, and then we did it again on Monday. But what they would do for me, when, and the only thing that I didn't like about it was summer vacation would come, and when all the other kids were off you know, doing what they wanted to do, that's when they would load me up with the scripts that had a lot of Eddie, because they gave them three extra hours of film time, when normally in a typical day they can only get me like for two and a half hours. But when there's no school, that three hours transfers over into work time. So when everybody else was on vacation that I knew, that's when I was working. But it led to some really good shows that featured Eddie, so it worked out pretty well. You're welcome. How many episodes a year did they shoot? Well, first year we did 39. Wow. Second year they knocked it back for Fred, because Fred was really feeling it, uh, Fred Gwynn and Herman Munster. Uh, 31 the second year, but we had a total of 70 in two years. Well, if we would have done another 39, obviously it would have been 78 episodes. Um, but um, we, they let us go back to 31. And that, 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 that was the norm back then. That's why a lot of people think that it was on longer, because the combination of no competition, you know, there was no internet, there was no cable. The, basically, the, the boob tube was the entertainment for the household. And in the Midwest especially, primetime started at 6.30. 
Uh, so we were on at 6.30, 7.30, depending on where you lived, and that was right in the middle of the kids came home when the street lights came on, dinner was, pre dinner was served, and it was, you know, the country was very much like the Donna Reed show. You know, that was it. You know, everybody was around watching television, and they remember them vividly simply because they, they, they enjoyed it, but there was not a lot else to uh, draw their attention. Yes, sir. The difference between the TV shows and the feature? Well, in a feature, you film, a, it's a lot um, less per pages per day. And it's a lot more rehearsal and everything's a little, it's done a little, it's structured a little differently. Usually bigger and more expensive and they're a little slower before they do it because they basically have got a lot more money, more people on the set, bigger crew. We would do about seven or eight pages a day of the, of the Munsters and that would be typical. And it features usually about three pages a day. But what's weird is I did a Saturday morning show called Lidsville where we did a little 12 pages a day, which was crazy because we had three cameras and we had chroma key and they were really racing through it. And it was, you know, it was like light speed. But normally on a feature, it's, it's done a little bit slower and more methodical. Were they uh, shooting 16 millimeter? Uh, the months, yeah. Yeah, 16. We had old Mitchell cameras. Uh, it was the, very much the end of the old school one of the things about the Munsters, that, another thing, the reason it was done so well, is back in the old days, every studio had a specialty. Um, the 20th century was the disaster movie studio. MGM was the musical studio. Another studio was the Western studio, Four Star. We happened to Universal was the monster studio. They did the monster movies, and they did them really, really well. So they took all that talent they had learned from Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman movies, and that's why the Munsters looks like literally a, a mini movie. It was done on film, the lighting, the techniques, the camera angles was all, all done very much like a really good quality, uh, you know, Bela Lugosi movie. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I hadn't thought about that on the... Uh, when you look the at the sets and the lighting and, and the music and the way it's done, they really, they really pulled out all the stops and came up with a really quality little series that even though it was a comedy, it would look very spooky and scary. Yeah, spot no. You saw his head, you saw his tail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, anyway, and it was fun, it was good, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the monster angle, they really they did a good job. We had the Westmore family uh, doing the makeup, then Bud was the head of the studio, uh, the head of the department. Mike Westmore, who you may know from Face Off, who's his daughter Mackenzie, hosted it. He was, I was his first, um, uh, I guess, ward. He, his job was to get me started in the morning, put my ears on, put my way to speak on, then he would take care of Pat Priest and do her makeup. But he was an apprentice, so I really was very lucky that I started off with like one of the best in the business as my personal little makeup guy and my friend, and we're still friends today. Excellent. Do I have memorabilia? I had some suits. Uh, they actually, I got... They, they, I auctioned them off years ago, a long time ago. God, and they, they, brought a, they brought a pretty penny. But um, the Wolf Wolf I've got. I have the Tribute Munster Cars and the Dragula, which I received. I bought a couple of years ago. I recently got the Stingray bicycle that, that George Barris and Von Dutch had built for Eddie, but it never made it on the film. They brought it out. I sat on it. I rode it around the studio. as my studio bike, but it never made it to, the, uh, to, to, uh, to an episode. So I have merchandise and memorabilia like, you know, lunch boxes and stuff like that, but nothing from the show per se, other than the Wolf Wolf and the tribute cars. Well, yes. Yeah, sure. Back when I was doing this, the, 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 what was the end of that that I didn't catch? Yeah, there, there was, well, I was the only kid at Universal Studios unless there was a guest starring role to come visit me and hang out. So I was pretty much, um, it's funny because in the Munster Memory book that I put together featuring stories from people and, you know, what the show meant to them and then people that actually participated in the show, the, uh, at the end of it they asked me, well, what's your favorite memory? And I said, well, you know, the, literally I was working on the Munsters, but my favorite memory wasn't of the Munsters, it was from Universal Studios because when I wasn't on call and I had some time, can you imagine what, little, what a 12-year-old boy's like to do? They like to go explore. And here I've got the world's greatest studio. I'm in full makeup, so I can go anywhere I want. 
You know, I know how to open a stage door without, you know, making the, the red light go off. I can sneak in. And for me, my favorite thing to do was go to the Phantom of the Opera set, which was the biggest sound stage in, in Hollywood, five stories tall, and get up in the catwalks and wander around. I mean, this was like the best of the best. And uh, I would sneak off and do that. Or I'd go visit Ernie Borgnine and Tim Conway at the uh, McHale's Navy Lagoon. Um, my uncle used to supply horses to the Western, so you'd go up to see Wagon Train and go up to see the Virginian. Alfred Hitchcock, you know, catch a ride with him down in the commissary. So this was like, for me, that was my greatest memory, was being able to be on the lot, not on the months when I'd get away from stage 32. That was fun for me. You know, that's, that was my job. This was fun. So it was, that, that's, that was the neatest thing that I had going for me, was a chance to really um, be, a, be a little boy, do my job, of course, but at the same time, have some free time to go have some fun. What was like? What was it like? What was schooling like? I mean, you, I know you went. You say you had so many hours per day, but I mean, uh -huh. you had a private tutor, I take it. Yeah, three hours a day, private tutor. They supply. It's called a welfare worker, and she's there to make sure you get your education and don't go crazy and don't become neurotic. <laughs> um, and the one thing that I would do back then, I bit my fingernails a lot. So every six months, you had to go up for a work permit. And my mom was like, they're not gonna, they're not gonna give you a work permit. Look at your nails. And it's like, so I, I like forced myself not to bite my nails for like three or four days before I'd have to go up there just so they weren't down to nubs. I don't bite them today, but I did back then. But they keep a pretty close eye on you and three hours a day, but you have to be in at least 20 minutes at a time or it doesn't count. So what they would do is they'd whisk you off the set and then throw you into school and then there'd be a guy waiting at the door 19 minutes and then, 20 minutes, come on. <laughs> and then you do your set, you do your business and you go flying back in for 20 minutes because it was, tiff, it was tough for them to wait around for you. That's why the summer times when they had you free reign with no school is when you really worked your butt off. Right here. Yes, sir. Well, it's, it was interesting, too, because um, when I was doing the show, my mom was actually living in the East Coast with my stepdad, who was a pro ball player for the Washington Senators. I flew out from Illinois. For this, I don't know how many of you ever saw the pilot with Happy Derman and Joan Marshall of the Munsters. But at the last minute, they decided this wasn't the cast that they wanted. They were, they were happy with the Marilyn and Herman and Grandpa, but they wanted a new uh, matriarch mother and son. So my agent got them to fly me from Illinois, where I was living with my grandma, small town, flew me out to the screen test, hired me. Well, now I don't have a family out there because my family's in the East Coast, so I lived with my uncle, hired a woman to take me to work, and um, the deal was that the, because I didn't have a family unit there, and I, Yvonne DiCarlo had kids my age, Pat Priest had kids my age, Al Lewis had a PhD in child psychology, had kids, Fred Gwynn had kids, did children's books. So even though I wasn't with my family, I was around a very cool TV family that, you know, kind of filled in for me, but the show was produced by the people that did Leave It to Beaver. So the crew had been around a very kid-friendly situation. So by, by being alone, I was around a lot of loving people that were very easy to deal with, and I was a 39-year-old midget. So <laughs> the, the, the combination of all that fit in to where I was just one of the guys, but for as far as learning stuff, I was around some very wonderfully talented people that were very patient with me and taught me a lot of stuff. I knew, I mean, I knew, I knew how to do it, but uh, it help to be around them to like a lot of times you'll see kids on series where they don't really have very meaty parts they kind of come and they go and they just walk in and walk out well they wrote some really good scripts because fred and al worked with me and it became it, i became their equal so to speak like herman munster especially became the child i would be the adult in the conversation he would be the childlike person in the conversation because it played well and it, eddie and you know eddie and pop you know i was you know, he was pop and i was eddie and it worked out really well so i learned a lot from all of them but Al was probably the one I was closest to. And he was a big sports fan, and he would toss a frisbee with me and toss a baseball and go outside the studio door and, and kind of let me be a kid, where Fred taught me more about the techniques of acting. And Fred was great because he says, never trust the suits in Hollywood. He hated the producers. He was the actor's actor. Don't trust those suits. And so I learned some from all of them. You still trust the suits? No. Okay, good. You learned your lesson. No. You learned your lesson. No, no suits. <laughs> Any other questions? You've got them here. Come yeah. On. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, no. well, I'll tell you what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on currently. Okay, go ahead. Oh, currently? Okay, well, it's interesting because the grandma that I spoke about, she's no longer with us, been gone about 30 years. But 
after the months, I went back and lived with her. She had moved from Illinois to a, from a little apartment to a big house that she bought that was built in 1875. So I went back to this little town in Macon, Missouri, went through the eighth grade, small town. This is one of the reasons I consider myself lucky that I had, I had a balance from Hollywood. I never was really a Hollywood kid. I didn't live in Hollywood. I lived about 30 miles away and I commuted. Always had my, separate, my friends down here and I would pretty much go about my business in Hollywood without telling anybody. That was, I, I thought acting was really like second class work. I didn't, I didn't look at it as something special. Looked at something like was making me money for my race car, but I didn't really brag about it. So when I went back to Missouri to go visit grandma again, um, she had bought this big old house. And I kept an eye on it over the years. Whenever I go cross country, if I was in the area, I'd stop in and visit friends in, you know, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Well, anyway, I wound up buying the house two years ago. And it's haunted. I didn't know it when I bought it. My sister told me, she goes, you know that house is haunted. I go, no. And she goes, yeah. I go, I never saw it go. She goes, well, you were always out with grandpa, you know, fishing and hunting. You weren't really around the house often. You were always, you know, you came and you slept and you got up and you left. But apparently it was haunted. And now uh, I've been restoring the house, beautiful old place. The, um, it is haunted. I mean, I never really had dealt with ghosts before. I didn't really, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't disbelieve, but I didn't believe, but I never had had an encounter one way or the other. So my sister, I believed her because, you know, it's not like she's a wacko and she's not like she's on drugs or, you know, doing anything crazy. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to have to get back and develop this situation. And sure enough, when we got there, I brought some paranormal um, experts, friends in from uh, St. Louis to check out the house. And readings and noises and smells and all this stuff that goes along with it and activity because the house happened to be built on a vortex. So now in the ghost community, what I have is a Grand Central Station where ghosts are coming and going constantly, a lot of activity. And um, you ever watch Shark Tank, anybody? Show, well, Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank, I was introduced to him in St. Petersburg, Florida last year. He just happened to have bought into a production company out in L.A., and I then met with his partners, and they were looking for family value, interesting stuff, and paranormal shows. There's, I believe there's 17 of them on the air at the moment. So we're going to do a show called Property Horrors, H-O-R-R-O-R-S, and the idea is for me to go meet people around the country who are Munster fans and have paranormal issues where they bought a property like me, were not knowing the, uh, the tenants were ghosts in addition to themselves. So that's going to be a new show coming out. I'm really excited about it because it allows me to not only showcase my house and my little town that I live in. I like to call it Andy of Mayberry meets Eddie Munster in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> uh, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's fun. It's, I'm reconnecting with old friends, restoring an old home. It's got a lot of, you know, if you've got like an onion and you're peeling off a lot of layers. But uh, with a little bit of luck, I'll be back on the air. Uh, it is a reality show. I hate the term reality show, but that's what they call them. But I think the real show, it's the ghosts are great, but I like the idea of reconnecting with, with uh, small town roots and friends, and I think that's going to be a show in itself once we get the ghost thing out of the way. I think people will really like the idea of uh, a Hollywood actor kid going back to somewhere that he lived uh, 47 years before and enjoying it. You know, 5,000 people then, 5,000 people now. It's pretty much, it's an interesting, uh, it's an, an interesting journey. So keep an eye out for property horrors. You also have uh, the cars you talked about. Yeah, they're, in, they're on display in the tent. Uh, the Munster Coach and Dragula tribute cars. The originals are in a museum and they're really like in pretty bad shape. These are cars that a gentleman built that I worked with a few years ago. We met and he retired and he says, you know anybody wants to buy the cars? And I go, I'd love to have them. So for somebody that's been kind of like, you know, messing around with, you know, I didn't really do a whole lot for a few years because I was sort of like, you know, drinking too much, but I've been sober for over six years, yay, and, <laughs> and cleaned up my act. And I got married in September, first time, I'm 63 years old. Got the wife, got the house, got the cars, and the Munsters is strong, and life is good, and I enjoy getting out and sharing my, you know, I kind of started fast, took a left turn at Albuquerque, but I'm back. How was Albuquerque? Never it was great, I just came from Albuquerque. <laughs> And you've got the ghosts along with the And I got the, the ghosts, that's right. Now, no, can, you, can you get them to pay rent? Well, hopefully, you know, it's funny, I keep telling people, I have this thing called a 1313 weekend. Um, you know, everybody knows that's the address of the Munsters. So what I do is, instead of turning it into a bed and breakfast, which is like a lot of work, I'm just going to host once a month, I'm going to have 13 people come in on a Saturday, 13 people come in on a Sunday, and spend the day, bring their ghost equipment, hang out, go to the cemetery, see the ghosts, meet the ghosts, ride around in the Munster coach I own, 
take them to lunch and let them enjoy what I'd enjoy on a daily basis. And uh, that's how I'm going to that's how I'm going to um, subsidize the restoration of the house because it's a big undertaking. Uh, I was a little naive when I bought it, not really knowing what I was getting into, but you buy an old house with 142 years old. I've already put a roof on it, I already did the electrical, I already did the plumbing, and I like to keep it a little rough around the edges because that's what people expect. If you make it pristine, then you kind of lose the ghost angle. So I'm gonna keep, it's not like a Munster house, it's not covered in dust and cobwebs, but it is an old house, it has a lot of character and personality because back in the old days, this guy that built it was the richest guy in town, he was a coal baron. So he spared no expense building the house. So it's got some really great woodwork and it's got five fireplaces with these wonderful mantles and it's you know big massive rooms and giant you know pocket doors with walls this thick. It's really cool. Plus it's on two acres. So for a kid coming from you know the beach district where you're lucky to have a sixteenth of an acre, I got forty seven trees that I get I get to mow around every couple of weeks. I got two riding lawn mowers. I'm a, I'm a kid in a candy store. Have you found any, have you found the, uh, the sliding panels and the revolving bookcases? No, 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 and I don't have, I've, but I need to get a, a suit of armor for sure. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I got, and I have a hidden stairway, the butler stairway in the back that nobody knows about because there used to be a butler situation going on and uh, it's a great old house and it's fun to do and I, I mean I can't live there forever because it's just a little too slow paced but it's a nice balance because I'm on the road a lot. It's in the middle of the country, so it's geographically desirable for my cars and my businesses. I do a lot of, I've been doing drag strips recently with the two cars, recreating the Hot Rod Herman episode, where Herman loses the car and Grandpa builds a Dragula. So we go to drag races, and then uh, right before the finals on Sunday, we do the race again. So I'm actually kind of doing what I wanted to do in the beginning, was to race cars. And I, I, I think I found a good niche for myself. It's, it's a fun, fun deal. Uh, the kids, like I say, meeting the third generation in person and seeing their smiling faces. And the funny part is when their parents try to point out in the picture that that's me and the kids look at their parent like, yeah, right. It's like, what have you been doing, Dad? You know? Well, you, you, you just take out your, your makeup pencil and put the little yeah. but you're pointed. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, okay, there he is. Uh, only at Halloween. You, uh, you mentioned, I've heard it mentioned uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, of course, you're here in Pensacola. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know recently you were in Tampa, you, and you're doing, uh, you do a lot of, you hang out in Florida a lot? Yeah, I moved to Florida in 1994, actually, in St. Pete Beach. I lived there for five years, left for, uh, went up to Atlanta for a year, came back for the 2000 in Orlando, and my wife happens to live in Orlando. So she grew up, and she's, a, she's actually a, a native Floridian, which very few of, you know, very oh, few, yeah. there's very few of them. <laughs> but um, it works out well because my family's in L.A., her, she's in Florida, my house is in the Midwest, and... Um, the Munsters is popular everywhere, and there's car-related stuff everywhere. So literally, I'm on the road all the time. I'm going to do a Route 66 tour, stopping along the way and document it and, and hopefully get a show that I would like to do. I mean, the, the paranormal show is fine, but I really want to do a road show with the cars and uh, hitting the road because when I was a kid, my grandma used to drive cross-country in a 59 pink Cadillac with a little U-Haul trailer, and I was her co-driver, co her, co her co not really a driver, but... I would uh, be her companion, and I got to stop at every state park and every cavern and meteor crater and anything that was interesting along the way. She was uh, she drove about 45 miles an hour, so I saw it firsthand, very slow. <laughs> but I really enjoyed the Amer the American road trip stuff, so I really would like to convey that into some kind of a Route 66 tour, featuring all the good stuff that America has to offer on the road. That's something I would like to do. When I think I, I think I can pull it off. It sounds like fun. It would be fun. It is fun. People are nice. I love going out and being Eddie Munster. It's cool. <laughs> I mean, people will come up and say, you don't look too familiar to me. And you can, you know, they can tell that I have a little thing around my neck that shows comedy and tragedy. So people, what do you do? I said, oh, I used to be an actor. Well, what did you do? And like, they're kind of with a, with a little bit of a snide remark. And I go, well, do you ever watch the Munsters? And they go, yeah. And you were Eddie? And they immediately go, I love that show. I used to run over from school. Oh my God, can you talk to my husband? He's not going to believe me. <laughs> so that's what keeps me going is because people, once they figure out what you're doing and who you are, it just brings a smile to their face. And, it, and it's, an easy, it's an easy thing to do. And if you, can, if you can bring that much happiness just by going out and being yourself, you're a pretty blessed person. So I'm very lucky. How many of the regional cast are still with us? Just Marilyn. Uh, and there were two Marilyns, Beverly Owen, first 13 episodes. She won it out of the show because she was told the show was going to be a failure, so she came from New York thinking she was coming out for a week, and then the show was a huge hit. She was stuck out there, and her husband, she was, you know, she was a husband-to-be, excuse me, 
was living in New York, who was a producer of Captain Kangaroo. And she wanted to go home, so Fred and Al went, went to this producer and said, you've got to let her out of this contract, because this is like harsh and unusual punishment, because all she would do would, would knit and cry all day long. And they finally let her go, because Fred and Al threatened to quit the show themselves. Then they brought in Pat Priest, uh, and Pat Priest did the next 57 episodes, which was pretty good, because they, a lot of people didn't even see the, the switch. It wasn't like the two Darrens, where Dick York was gone, and you, meet, you immediately knew Dick Sargent was not Dick York. You know, okay, his name's Dick, but this is not the same guy. But what happened, what happened was, is, you know, Beverly Owen, what I thought was very interesting, a couple things was, when she left her husband-to-be, they did get married, he, I think his name was Don Stone, but anyway, he went on to create Sesame Street. Which I thought was pretty cool, you know. They, she was around some good stuff, and they did some good things. And then um, the other thing was she went into Sesame Street. And Pat Priest, her mom was Ivy Baker Priest, who was the treasurer of the United States in the Eisenhower administration. So I always thought it was cool that Pat Priest went from the White House to the Munster House. <laughs> well, that's a stretch. Yeah, but not as no, I'm not making <laughs> any other questions. Back over here. I missed that one. Uh, uh, the dream role you wish you could oh, have played. Oh, I, I can tell you. The, I, I, everybody in Hollywood has got one of those I screwed up. Well, <laughs> I've got hair down to here. I'm 17 years old at the beach. Uh, 18 years old. I just had finished Lidsville. Just had finished Lidsville. So I'm at the beach, and I get this call the Mary Grace's there's a guy here an unknown young filmmaker he wants you to do a movie and I go ah you know and okay I'll meet with him so he, he comes to me to the beach sits down my hair's down here I'm out of the water and he sits down and one thing leads to another and he goes well I got this great little movie that I'll have a shoot but you're gonna have to cut your hair it's it takes place in 1962 and I go ah, I'm not even interested I'm, I, he, no thanks thanks but no thanks and very nice to meet you, Mr. Lucas. Bye. So, two years later, I'm in the theater, and I see American Graffiti, and I see Richard Dreyfuss, and I go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What have I done to my career? So, the funny part is, I turned down that role, which would have been Richard Dreyfuss' part. Cindy Williams still rags on me. She goes, you could have been my brother. So, um, what happened was, I turned down American Graffiti, Big mistake. Now, the funny part about that is, is you think that's bad, is Paul and Matt, who played Big John Milner, he turned down Han Solo in Star Wars because he was too busy with Vincent Bugliosi doing Helter Skelter with Charlie Manson. So I, I gave up American Graffiti. He gave up uh, Star Wars. Then my mom asked me, she goes, I don't understand why you never got an interview for, for uh, Luke Skywalker. I go, you know, Mom, I don't think George is going to give me a second chance to say thanks, but no thanks. You know? <laughs> I, I missed, that, that train is gone. But that was, my, uh, that was my role. The one thing I wanted to do, I wanted to do a Twilight Zone. Never got a chance to do that. I wanted to do a Star Trek. Missed out on that. Um, that was, I wanted to work with Haley Mills. I had such a crush on her. Never got you, that. You and everyone else. I know. I, I went up for an uh, interview from Summer Magic in about 1962, 1963, and I didn't get it. I was bummed. But most of the time, I, I had a pretty good batting average. Um, you know, I got about half the roles I went up for, which is pretty good. So it wasn't like I was doing without. But I, uh, I only worked 11 years, but I did, you know, of those 11 years, four of them were series, which took up six years. So, you know, not too bad. Lidsville? Yeah. It's the kooka kookiest. Charles Nelson Riley and Billy Hayes, who is Richie Poo and Puff and stuff, and I went up for that interview, never wanting to do it, but I actually turned it down three times. Sit and Marty kept calling me, and I kept telling Sid, I don't want to do this show, I don't want to do this show. Why? Because it's silly, and it's Saturday morning, and all my friends will make fun of me. I'm in high school. So I went to the Calcils, who I went to school with, and I said, would you turn down a series? They go, are you crazy? You never turned down work in Hollywood. So I wound up doing it thinking all my friends would be asleep on Saturday morning. They'd never see it. Wrong. You know, two years on ABC, two years on NBC. Now, in hindsight, I look back on it. It was really a fun, a fun, little, fun little show. A lot of work, but a lot of fun. And Charles Nelson, <laughs> Charles Nelson <laughs> Riley, CNR, you know. Yeah, he, used to, he used to sneak up behind me no matter where I was. I'd catch me. He grabbed me and kissed me. And I love you. I don't care who knows it. And I go, Charles, damn it, stop it. Leave me alone. 
And it was like back in the old days when, you know, they kind of kept things under wraps if you were gay or if you weren't gay, whatever. And, you know, and Billy Hayes was gay. She's been with her, her significant other for over 50 years. And Charles, they used to all go out to dinner together, the four of them, and everybody thought everybody was heterosexual, but they were all gay. And I didn't care less, but finally, I had no idea what was going on because we had, we had about 40, 40 little people working on the show as well. So we had a combination of, you know, um, this and that. The, the little people were working with us as well. So we had a very interesting 11 weeks in the summer of 71 for this young man. Cool. It was great. Yes? They, well, they were all geared, they, all, they were all done, they had a template, uh, 16 episodes, every show they did. They had things, 16 episodes, seven reruns, two years. Every show they did was like that. And um, the funny thing, the Bugaloos was the one after Puffin Stuff before Lidsville, and that the girl on the, on Puffin, on, on the Bugaloos, I can't remember her name at the moment, but real cutie pie, Claire something, I think. Anyway, one of the reasons I did the show was I thought I might run into her. She never showed <laughs> She never showed. But it was a good time. It was fun. Sid and Marty were great guys, very talented people. They, you know, a lot of people don't know that they were uh, master puppeteers, marionettes in Europe and stuff. And then they also did the Brady Bunch Hour. They did the Donnie Marie Show. They did a few other things. Spit and Image was a real, uh, the D, excuse me, DC Follies. They did the DC Follies, which was way ahead of their time, where they would, you know, lampoon and, and, and oh, wow. make these I things. Forgot about that. Yeah, show, yeah, DC Follies. So they were very talented guys. The funny thing about Sid and Marty Croft is, when you got your paycheck, there was a third brother nobody ever knew about. Harry Croft signed the checks, and I never knew who Harry Croft was. I never saw him. <laughs> you know, it's the world of Sid and Marty, but, but Harry's paying for it. I was got got to trust somebody with the money. Right? I guess, and then, I don't even know if he actually existed. Okay, we have a hand up here in the front row, and I think we're going to be, are we running out of time? How are we doing on time? Time? No one's here. Okay. Five more minutes. Yes or no, do you have any secret celeb hookups? Secret celeb hookups? <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a secret if I shared. <laughs> <laughs> but of course. Eddie Muster, you know, I'm like, that occasionally comes, that occasionally comes into play. <laughs> After all, we, I, grew, I, I was a teenager in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I mean, I, I, one of the things about today, I, I kind of feel sorry for kids and stuff because I wouldn't have given away, you know, given up my being born in 53, catching a little bit of Elvis, all the Beatles, you know, and then the 70s, the best rock and roll ever, and, you know, TV, and I, I really felt that I've been blessed with being alive in the best window of opportunity I could have asked for. And it ain't over yet, but, you know, I grew up, you know, on Facebook and stuff, you'll see old, old posts of people that, do you remember a payphone, or do you remember this, and do you remember that? And literally, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I, I, you know, I grew up with, in muscle cars and, and, and rock and roll and Beatles and stuff. And, and I was lucky to be part of the 60s, you know, in the 60s, and the, social, the whole social upheaval and stuff. I feel that I've been very, very blessed. And it, and it carries over into stuff like this. You know, I'm just, I'm just the one lucky little guy. I could have done without the velvet shorts, but hey. <laughs> We good? How are we, how are we doing? We five have more, five, we more, five minutes. more minutes. We got five. We got, got, it, got it for five more minutes, and that's it. He's going to hop in his... Dragula. And Dragula. No. Okay, up front. And the... Ford, Chevy, Ford. Oh, the, the, my cars? Well, I was, a Ford, I was a Ford guy. My first car was a 69 Mach 1, but... It wasn't fast enough, so I, uh, I saw a 69 L88 Corvette one day, and I, I got rid of my Mustang, I bought the Corvette. So I sort of became a Chevy guy. The Munster coaches were Dragula, were, they were Ford, small block Fords. Mine have Chevy motors in them because the guy was a Chevy guy. My stepdad owned a dealer, Chrysler dealership, so when I was 18, 19, 20, I was driving 340 Cudas, Dusters. So to answer your question, all three will do. See, I was, a, I was a Chrysler 300 guy, you know, yep. big one, yeah. fins, ram yeah. induction. Yep. Okay. The creepiest thing that's happened in my haunted house, I haven't really, they haven't bothered me. My sister came back and had a really bad experience that we had to call in the experts to get rid of. We had a, a party crasher ghost who was kind of like there to, to, to wreak havoc. 
And um, we got him, got rid of him. I, the only thing that happened after my wedding, we had a little bit of a reception and I had people, actually the gentleman in Florida who introduced me to Kevin, to Kevin Harrington came up and he came flying out of the attic, not the, you know, no pen intended, white as a ghost. And the door slammed behind him, the light had gone off. So somehow he physically got, you know, shoved. But the scariest thing, Actually, it would have been the unruly uh, party crasher ghost that my sister had to go through, uh, which really kind of bummed her out because she had had a, had a good relationship with Miss Ruby. She'd never had a problem, but it had been like 40 years later. Wait a second. What's, what was one of your guests at your wedding doing up in the attic? <laughs> oh, well, no, because I was showing him. I, oh, okay. I was showing him. I was showing, yeah, I was showing him the house because this is like, you know, in fact, I've got pictures if you come to the table when I get back. Um, I've got a lot of images of ghost stuff on the walls and ceilings and floors, let alone in windows. And there's actually a video that my sister took, excuse me, my, my, my wife took on her phone. For some reason, uh, smartphones have a tendency to be able to pick up ghost images. I don't know why it is, but for whatever reason, you can't see them with the naked eye, but you can see them and they, there's an image. And I have one of the, the ghosts going across the screen and then ducking back out. And I took a, I took a, a screenshot of him screenshot of him and blew it up and it looks very much like a Herman Munster face. It's got very profound eyebrows and kind of a level head and it's like, what in the heck's going on? You know, who's messing with me? But uh, it's, it was actually, and my, and my wife's very perceptive to it. So she, when she first came and moved in with me, we spent the first four nights in a hotel. She wouldn't stay in the house. And it would be like, are oh, you gonna stay tonight? And she'd wait about 10 o'clock, she said, no, I, we can't stay here tonight. So here we, I'm running up a hotel tab while I've got a giant mansion, you know, with plenty of bedrooms, but no, we're in the hotel. So after the fourth night, she finally said, okay, we're just going to, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just I'll stay here. But yeah, there's a lot of activity there. And I know people want to come visit. I'm, you're going to come visit me? Absolutely. I, I was telling, I was telling uh, Butch that I have been asking for years, my, my bucket list, I want to have a paranormal experience. Mm -hmm. And I go to shows and I go to paranormal experts. I said, here's my phone number. Give me a yep. call. I'll fly out at on, anytime you want. Yep. And no one's ever called. Well, yeah, when I first bought the house, I wasn't living in it uh, for the first three months, but I had friends in the area that had offered to go over and, and move stuff. It had been vacant for five years and it needed some immediate attention. And while they were in there, I'd get texts giggling, you know, footsteps. Uh, I mean, they, they, it was pretty much common knowledge that there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on in the house prior to me getting there from people who you know were very sound and sane and upstanding people and you know pillars of the community who were over there saying yeah this is there's just a lot of activity in this house and the whole area is has a the, the whole town was built on mining so there's a lot of tunnels everywhere and this and that so it's kind of Jesse James was hanging around there Bonnie and Clyde it's got a lot of history in this little town wait a second behind that moving bookcase <laughs> is a passage down into the tunnels mm -hmm. No, never mind. <laughs> but it's fun. It's a good time. Okay, well, we invite you to yeah. go visit the cars. They're in the uh, tent behind the, tent. the uh, arena. Come by and visit Butch at his table. He's uh, in the Celebrity East. And yes. then if you want to go around the other side, you can come visit me in Celebrity West. That's right. And uh, thank you all for coming and if out. if you want to take some business cards on the way out, they're right here. There you go. And we'll see you over there. Thank you for coming out so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. My pleasure.